Okay, so next speaker, Lena from Harvard. Um, will tell us all about her recent work. So thank you, Sean, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me uh, to share some of our work on how we going to uh, tackle the communication challenges when we apply digitalization for research education problem in cyber physical system. So this is a joint work with a few people. And Sinju was a student in KTH and is going to join my group as a postdoc. And she won't do was a postdoc, but going to start as a student professor in University of Central Florida. And Carla was a faculty in KTH, and Vahid was a colleague in Harvard, but now he's in Duke University. So to motivate the work, I want to start with a discussion of Internet of Things. I think when the word first come out, Internet of Things, a lot of people, including myself, think like thought it's uh, more like a buzzy word. But now we look around, we do have uh, more and more devices that are connected. And this is the number, how many devices are connected? Like you can think about yourself. You probably have a multiple computer, multiple tablet, and multiple even multiple cell phones. And plus a smart home device. It's projected by 2020, probably every person on average will have like seven devices that's connected through the internet or different kind of communication protocols. So why we want to connect all the device, we want to improve the quality of life. From the operation and control point of view, how are we going to define the quality of life? If we are able to formulate our operation problem, so we would like to maximize the social welfare and also to make sure the system is operating safely. And sometimes we can call it like the quality of services. Since it's a huge network connected, now you can imagine how we're going to coordinate. So there's a lot of paper in distributed organization that have been promoted to handle the challenges in the large scale of Internet of Things or smart grid, smart city. So no matter whether it is a like radio structure, by radio structure here, the orange arrow means the communication. As it is a control center, talk to individual device, or we let device talk to each other to negotiate what their decision. A common theme that we usually assume to apply the digitalization is we assume the device can communicate, talk to each other, compute the decision, and communicate until they kind of reach a point they agree on to take the action. So the assumption is like iterative two-way communication, and we can trust the communication. So and this is typically how we're going to analyze the performance. We're going to have some optimization problem, like social welfare to maximize, and there's some constraint we want to satisfy, whether it's a dynamical constraint or stationary constraint. And over the controllable variables, like some device we can change, some device we cannot change. And given information of the external input, for example, the disturbance, uncertainties, how much demand we need to generate to make sure everyone has electricity to use, or how much generation from the renewable energy. So that's what we call as the external input. To use the approach, we need some information, and we also need the communication. What's the challenges or difficulty when we talk to industry people? Can you adopt my method? And then we look at the practical things of the problem. If we just apply the approach in real system, in the real cyber physical system, like the first challenge about the sensing part. And for the sensing, if we really want to know what exactly people are going to do for the next hour, it's very hard. And it will be a delayed information, it will be inaccurate. And secondly, when we try to do the modeling, like if, even we assume, okay, now we're not dealing with human, we're dealing with the physical plant, we have inaccuracy in models as always. And we have heard many talks talking about, we have uncertainty about actuator, uncertainty about system modeling, how is it going to affect our performance? And the last one, like this talk we'll focus on, is the communication challenges. So many of you heard about a lot of people working on the 5G because there are lots of communication challenges in the existing protocols. And uh, here, no matter what kind of communication protocols we're going to use, we face different type of challenges. Noise, package loss, long delay, uh, using the power line, communication has limited bandwidth, like, and now people are talking about cybersecurity. So why we care about those? Because like, this is a famous picture from the satellite 
capturing the Northeast Black Hole in 2003. So when we try to really call it a device, the advantage is we can achieve better efficiency, like can help each other. But the sad effect, if we're not designing our algorithm method well, it will also propagate the bad decisions. So if a few decisions happen at the same time, it's very easy to lead to a system level cascading failure in a very short time period. So that's motivated the recent work in real-time optimization that's kind of fit into the theme of this workshop. What do I mean by that? So last time, when during the societal workshop, uh, societal network workshop, we have saw this picture multiple times. So if we use optimization just as a feed-forward open loop scenario, like getting some information of the system, including the disturbance, take optimization algorithm, then tell each device what we're going to take. So usually we call this an open loop control or we use the optimization at feed forward scenario. And now people sometimes say, OK, we can implement it in a real-time fashion, a feedback fashion. What this means is, so this is the physical networks. Uh, we can have all the devices taking the sensing. And once I have the information, I can tell all the actuators what we're going to do. So you're probably wondering, like, I'm kind of putting the different, like, multiple arrow here. This is kind of capturing the communication channel. So if I just locally, my sense as device as a sensor and to the controller, like you can sometimes people refer as a fully decentralized. And that will have limited ability. So then we can use a communication channel that the different sensors talk to each other. So this is a very nice picture. It can adjust certain limitations, as I mentioned before. For example, we can just focus on the sensing like measure the measurement that is easy to measure, like the state variable instead of disturbance variables. And since it's a feedback control, so even we have an inaccuracy of the system model, it still guarantee certain performance. But this is another challenge that we um, see some talks on Tuesday about the communication challenges through the communication channel. So what I'm going to show is like first, I will show how we can kind of use the physical measurement to reduce some communication. But then if we want to further reduce communication, then we need to quantize and think about the coding coding schemes. The question leads to is, what is that exactly the minimal needs of the communication? If we understand that well, so probably we can think about what kind of communication protocols we should really design, what kind of resource we should put. So this is a high level of the big picture, how are we going to combine the real-time decision making with the improvements in the communication protocols? So, but in this talk, I will focus on a simple problem that has uh, different applications. So it's a resource allocation problem. So many of you have been seeing it many times because <laughs> it's in different community, we have a kind of common structure for the problem. I think it's a very, very simple one. So, we have a different device or users, and everyone has their like, ideal picture of what they want to uh, consume. And they can also have the local constraint, like lower bar, upper bar. And there's some control center can broadcast some information to coordinate. But there's a limited resource. Like the xi is how much resource consumed by individual device i. So now the question is, we're going to use the communication, send information, probably iteratively, price of uh, my request, and to coordinate. So this is a very standard textbook, now in mean textbook, so very standard textbook uh, framework for distributed resource allocation. And what I want to show, like as I mentioned, had lots of application, like as I was talking about smart grid, building control, data center, data center trying to coordinate the power consumption from different servers. And this is actually the, I like, put one on chip design. So even now, people from the GPU design, CPU design, they come to talk to me, OK, I also want to reduce communication when I to coordinate different kind of transistors. Can we do that? And also, especially for the communication like, uh, area, there's a lot of resource allocation problems. So what I'm going to show, so this was like this, some brief introduction in case some of you who didn't see this problem before. So why I say this problem is a well-structured, and because we understand the problem, the 
op optimality of the algorithm, like what exactly is the um, solution, even we have the closed form of the almost everything. So if we have this kind of from the primal domain to the dual domain, so this is our resource allocation problem. And when we take the dual domain, so this is a dual problem. We look at the dual problem is actually a very simple form, has a like dual, this is, if we assume also, assume this is strongly convex, concave function, and this actually we can also see is a convex best smooth property. And this is roughly, like I put the dual function structure, but what really matters I want to say is a dual gradient method. So by using the dual function, what we're able to do is the control, control center update the price signal according to the dual descent, and individual user i getting the price information, take their maximal or optimal decision under that price information, and send information back. And I want to highlight here is, so this is happened to be the dual gradient. So very simple scheme, and that's why in practice it's very easy to use. So the question I'm going to pose is this. So now think about that because I was saying <coughs> the communication, even we assume we think there's a communication among all the devices. But now even you think about for the building, even for this room, is all the light really connected to somewhere? We don't know, probably it's not. So when we're really talking about connect all the device or smart device, the first question people will say no, like it's a lot of investment on the communication channels. So first, our question, can we just reduce the communication need? Like instead of sending some requests back, can we just have one-way communication to broadcast? And secondly, is like how many bits we really need to broadcast? And if we can reduce the bit, it will open up different kind of resource we can use to implement the algorithm. So how are we going to do it? Questions so far for this one? Uh, so great, good. So let's look at the problem structure. The problem I put here, so this is a dual gradient design that we implement. If we assume everyone can negotiate, negotiate and take the action. So something I want, so first, the first question, we look at what it gets the dual gradient descent information is the summation of xi. So what this means is, if I, uh, individual device, take the action, and if I can measure the total consumption, that always happens, like the building control or even the wireless communication, I know how many resources are being used. So I don't need people to report the information to me, I can just take the action. Once I take the action, so that would mean like now I can just broadcast information of the price. But I need people to take the action. So now let's think about further reduce the communication. So how are we going to further reduce the communication? Like what I mean is what is the information I should send to coordinate? I'm pausing here, like if you have an answer you can tell me. It's Like, since we look at the algorithm itself, it's just the difference between how much resource is consumed and how much resource is available. So what exactly matters, the exact value doesn't play in really independent role. The difference or the sign of the difference play a more important role. So we can just send one bit to indicate the sign, and that suggests I'm going to implement in this way. So like, since I only send an indicator, so individual device can run some local estimator. Okay, I got something that will say, now the resource cost gen is violated or not violated. And then I'm able to kind of run some local estimator. And then I take the action. So that suggests for these schemes. So only use one bit communication, one bit, one way communication. So control center, take the measurement. And if it's larger, send a that direction, if it's smaller, then the other direction. And individual users, instead of just taking, like, do this calculation, also run some local estimator and to update the price information. And we're curious, right? So, what exactly is the performance for the algorithm? And again, this actually, like, 
look into the optimization textbook, like people already read a textbook about this method, because for the one dimension method, this is, turns out just be a normalized gradient descent method. So with a normalized gradient descent, so this optimization problem, I'm trying to minimize. And each time, instead of taking the gradient direction, I'm taking the normalized gradient direction. And there's some like step size you can choose. If it's one dimension, this become a one bit. You just need what is positive or negative information. So this is all the positive message suggest this work. So now this is like finally come to the mathematical problem I'm going to talk about. So now let's just focus on the dual problem itself. And as I said, that the dual problem, but every time remember the dual problem had a primal problem corresponding to the dual problem. And so the dual problem had uh, this structure, convex and L smooth, because it comes from the primal problem of utility function is strongly convex. So what we're going to focus on is, in general, so I talk about the one dimension case to say how it's going to be implemented. In reality, it's always a high dimension case. We have a multiple resource we need to coordinate. So first, I will talk about if I do the quantization on the gradient descent direction to understand how much quantization is needed. And first, let's just focus on the simple case, time invariant one. But to understand the communication complexity, like what we heard on Tuesday, is if you allow them to do the time varying communication, what this means is as a like, control center, when I call the encode the information, I kind of have all the kind of history information. And I can do the time varying coding encoding to broadcast the data, and people can use the information to update. And the question for this one, what is the minimal number of bits that is able to make my resource allocation problem going to work? What do I mean by that is algorithm can converge to the optimal solution with certain accuracy. And so I put it here is like for this scenario, we focus on the normalized direction because we didn't make any further assumption on the problem, like the boundaries of these things. So we've normalized, the, uh, the, so we just normalized the, like on the unit, unit sphere. And for this one so far, we have a, a other solution for the one dimension case. And for the multiple dimension case, we are still working on that. Questions for this general problem setup? So it actually has a lot of literature in this work. So um, in the digital polarization, people think about uh, quantization a lot. And for the quantization, so this is some work. I want to highlight the last one. So the last one is actually one bit subgradient method for deep neural network. And apparently, it's a like empirical. The paper had a lot of empirical study. Like if you do the one bit great subgradient descent, you will speed up the, uh, the process by like a lot, a large degree. So you can say it's not just parallelization, you need talking about communication. Because sometimes the communication will be the bottleneck of the speed of the algorithm. And this is on Tuesday, we heard a lot of talk when we control dynamical system, how are we going to handle the communication challenges or the fundamental limit. And I want to highlight this part of work because some of our definition is motivated by this line of work. For example, in 1987, uh, so John Cizik and Luo, they have a problem study if I had two processors and everyone had a, like processor one, processor two had objective function, how many number of bits they need to communicate to solve that two processor position problem. And this is from computer science community for the digital computing. If you have a like, data at different kind of processor, how, you can, how many bits are needed to compute a function? And recently, people from the machine learning extend all the study to the system inference problem. How many communication is needed if you want to apply, like understand the like, statistics of the data? So let's go to the result. So what we can find, or what kind of fundamental performance we can have for the first simple story, the time invariant gradient descent. So what do I mean by the fundamental limit? 
So this is a quantization. And when I do the quantization, before I really implement everything, I don't have much knowledge about what users I'm dealing with. The so rough information probably I get is, OK, it's, if I assume it's strongly convex, I kind of say I probably have some information about what is a strong, how strong convex it is, probably like that. So I say, when we say that when a Q weighs a good quantization, what we mean by that is the algorithm itself should work for any well-behaved problem. And since the problem is coming from the resource allocation problem, like, for example, for this case, it's convex and L smooth. So that's the question we put. So what kind of quantization can work for every problem that's well behaved? And then the few questions we want to ask is the following. <coughs> How are we going to determine like my quantization scheme is going to work no matter what kind of problem I'm going to have? And secondly is what is the minimal size of the quantization? And I, we want to understand the fundamental limit, what is the minimal number of bits. And once, if I have those kind of solution, how can I determine the DT and how to choose step size, given the proper quantization? And another, like, if I have uh, more resource, like, I can use more bits than one bit. How the additional information can help to improve the performance of the algorithm? So, yeah, questions? So when you say minimal size, is it with respect to this specific algorithm? Yes, or it is. It could be a different algorithm that achieves a smaller number. It can be, yes, yes, yeah. So uh, I will come back to the, that question and discussion after my talk. It's, uh, this is the reason we pick this one. Yeah, good questions. So, good. <coughs> so that's a question we want to uh, understand. So like, now you look at the problem, some of you probably think it's very familiar, right? So this is a time invariant quantization, like it's very kind of, even it's optimization, dynamic optimization algorithm, but it looks very like straightforward. So, and the truth, yes. So the intuition we have for this one is the descent direction. So take any optimization textbook, when you look at descent direction, what it means is, so this is my quantization direction. And this is my like, current gradient direction. So as long as they are close to each other, I mean the angle close to each other, I take this, instead of the true gradient direction, it should work. And yes, so by doing that, you can definitely prove the sufficient condition. By sufficient condition, what I mean is, if it's a descent direction, <coughs> then I can guarantee the algorithm going to converge. But the interesting question we were thinking about is, is this actually the necessary condition? So it turns out it's if and only if. So what this means is here we define the CDAR cover, and the CDAR cover basically just means for your quantized direction, for any kind of vector in this domain, you can find a quantized direction that is close, like the CDAR is smaller than pi over two. So as I, one direction to prove it's going to work is easy. And the other one, why this is the only way. So it's actually also easy because you can, we can easily come out with some kind of example. If it's not satisfy this like CDA cover property, you can always pick, construct one example, and like, you, you can pick one direction because the direction will be always like far away from other contact direction. And then you consider starting from this Point and this value, it will always be can deviate from the optimal solution. So this is like intuitive, um, but the question is based on that understanding, how I'm going to design my quantization scheme. So this is a some example. What kind of quantization is going to work? Going to work. So the first one is a like the very popular one people have been using, like the one bit subgradient in for the deep neuron is taking the sign of the gradient direction. And this is definitely a one CDA cover, but that's not the minimal one. So once you go into the high dimension vector case, so this is actually, you didn't use any kind of joint information between the like value at different dimension. So this is actually the minimal proper quantization. So uh, this is the one, so what we, why, so first I explain what is the quantization. So you just take all the normal bases and then just add another vector. And this is going to be a proper quantization, I mean, it's a star cover. But how we prove it's a minimal, because you can prove if the quantization 
cardianity is smaller than k plus 1, and it's always going to fail. And then this one, the cardianity is k plus 1, then you know this is actually the minimal proper quantization. And what is the message it means is you only need log 2 k plus 1 bit at each iteration. And the k is the dimension of the problem. So you can see that once you go to the higher dimension, so the problem, it has a log dimension property, like similar to for the upper stock, like once how your problem goes to many dimensions of the problem. So this is an example of the CDAR cover and the minimal quantization. So the next interesting question is how exactly is it going to affect my convergence rate? So we have a different type of convergence rate result depending on your optimality criterion. So this is the one optimality criterion that because at the optimal solution, the gradient should uh, like roughly equal, like should be equal to zero. And so like we pick the epsilon as my stopping criterion. So for this theorem, what this means is given a constant step size. So here we focus on constant step size, focus on constant step size, and there exists the T, make sure the PT, the current value, satisfies this optimal criterion. And the T is upper bounded by this one. So you probably want like, what exactly how I'm going to read it. I'm going to show you what the message from this convergence rate result. But first, the proof is um, like intuitive. Because we have a descent direction, you can guarantee the dt value will over decrease in if I'm like the gradient is larger than epsilon. So what's the intuition? Like what's the um, interpretation from the result? From here, I was trying to calculate it. What is the optimal, for example, the optimal step size? By optimal, I want to minimize the upper bound. So roughly I take the optimal step size and I got this kind of t. So I said we have some other convergence result. So roughly you can interpret it in the other way convergence rate of my solution. So convergence rate of the solution I have here is 1 over screw of t. So now compare with the non-quantized version. Like the optimal method, if you use natural, you have 1 over t squared. If you do the constant gradient descent, it's 1 over t. And because the quantization, it behaves similar like the subgradient method, 1 over square of t. And that's how much we lose by quantizing information. And uh, roughly, but you can continue adding more information to think about how much speed up we can have. Questions? So in this particular situation, when you pick your gamma, it's constant for it's all constant. directions. So yes. you could also have a diagonal matrix, so you're sort of scaling. Yeah, you mean change the gamma to be the time varying one, right? No, no, not time varying, but you can have a diagonal matrix instead of a constant scalar. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes, yeah, yeah. But I don't think this one will change much for this one. Yeah, a good point. Yes. Uh, here I only have like one corner step size. Um, I was wondering if you could give some intuition. Because, so if you have a convex problem, the gradient doesn't necessarily point towards the minimum, right? It, um, so gradient is, is 90 degrees away from the Even for my quantized direction, right? And even before the quantization, right? Like if you have a strangely conditioned problem, the gradient will... No, so here I have a smoothness. So smoothness means the gradient is ellipsis. So it's not that kind of like not well behaved problem. So, so for me, the great unquantized gradient, like the gradient direction is the steepest uh, descent direction. Yeah, the steepest yeah. descent doesn't necessarily yeah. point towards the optimum. Mm -hmm. it, it can point up to, but not including 90 degrees or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're talking about the x and x like star. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, does it matter that the quantized, obviously not because you've managed to bound this, but does it matter, it seems the quantized one could point kind of almost directly away from the, the optimal, the original. Uh, yeah, so here we, so like for the proof, I mean like we used like the objective value to prove it because for the strongly convex case, it, the story will be simpler. So here we only have smooth state, not strongly convex. That's why like, the, the thing we're talking about, like I point to the value function descent direction, not really like, uh, aligned with the x minus x t minus x star. So but the, the intuition for the proof, we look at the function value. And then to prove that like, if my gradient is not in, like if, if I have enough gradient information, right? then that means like, even I have a wrong information of the gradient, I can still guarantee the descent direction. But if I'm like my gradient, gradient is already very, very small, 
and then if I have a little bit of arrow, then that will be like um, like a big problem for me to really along the descent direction. That's why for here, if you if we want exact recovery of optimal solution, the gamma step size should be decreasing. The constant step size you will always convert to the optimal solution with a certain kind of range. Yeah. So intuitively, it seems that we get closer to the convergence point, then we might need a smaller number of quantization bits because gradient is not going to. Yeah. Work. So 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 that will show up for the second part of the talk when we go into the time volume because because that intuition happens, right? So then we okay, how are we going to allow that? Single dimensions. Yeah, I will show because why single dimension? Because we have a, some like mean max definition. I will show that later. Yeah, good question. So, um, but uh, before before I move from the second topic, so now because here you can see how my quantization, like how many number of bits going to affect my performance convergence rate, is through the CDAR cover. And the CDAR cover, if you really want to find the exact connection between the convergence rate and the number of bits, it's going to the, like, uh, Shannon's uh, theorem to the severe covering. Like, because this is the kind of CDAR cover and how many CDAR cover you need to do it. Um, like, we, I'm not going to talk about this in this talk. And this is some simulation result. It's always, um, I, I realize, so since I started doing application in power system, always simulation result is better than my theory. And, so for the, for the simulation, so we took a kind of two dimension to see how it's performed. So we have a two, two, two infinite uh, bandwidth, like means non-quantized algorithm. So this one, the steepest one, is just a gradient descent. And, but the other one, this one, is the quantized, uh, not quantized, the normalized. Because it's normalized, it's slower. So you look at here, the four bit per iteration. The same algorithm, I just like quantize the each iteration. The four bit matches the infinite bandwidth. If I send that information, it looks like there's a lot of information just got wasted. And from the simulation result, you couldn't you even like, couldn't really tell the difference between the normalized gradient descent and the quantized version. Yeah. So definitely like as our, our, our predict upper bound will be higher than this value. Yeah. So but let me to the uh, okay, before the second topic, I want to put some other, like this is a, some messages I want you guys kind of to take home is because I show you the nice result, like sufficient necessary, how it's going to affect the convergence rate. And when we're going to talk talking about the real problem, because the dual problem from the cyber physical system always has additional constraint, at least should it be positive. So we add the constraint, and then to think about, can we have a similarly fundamental result? Like, can the result of unconstrained case extend? Is the descent direction going to work? So, like, how many of you think it's going to work? Good. Okay, some of, oh, is a question or, or you think it's a question? <laughs> so, okay, it's not going to work. And actually the, the intuition come from the discussion we just had is because of the constraint, you can construct a kind of worst case so it's well, so like this is the descent direction and this is a quantized uh, like direction. So this is a gradient direction. So it can get stuck at the non-optimal if this one and this one is orthogonal. And for this one, it's not necessary to be a descent direction anymore because my constraint, so like this is my gradient descent direction and I will take this one as my quantized direction. But since I have a constraint, I do the projection, I go along this line. So it's not descent direction anymore. So it's not going to work. Uh, like it's kind of bummer, like how I'm going to use my method to deal with the real application. A uh, good news, the popular quantized method that's taking the sum of the gradient is going to work. So like this is, if you think about this is the dual problem. So all, usually the decision variable, the constraint is like the positive, that, that type of constraint. And so, the, so this is the like, projected dual gradient descent and taking the sign. So this method is going to work and similar convergence rate will hold. And for the, something I want to highlight. So probably you're wondering the gradient descent is such a simple method, how it exactly really work for the more complicated system. But all the intuition help us to design one control method for the voltage control had a more dynamics like a uh, larger scale had a more decision variable. And for this one, we have a one bit communication for the voltage control in digital networks. If that's interesting, like, uh, it's on my webpage for this paper. 
Okay, finally, we go to the more inter like mathematical interesting problem for the time varying condensation. I only have a uh, five or seven minutes. Yeah. So, but I think the most important thing I want to go through is the definition. So, so this is the uh, this is our resource allocation problem. So I bring it back because this additional, so originally I only kind of, okay, this is a primal pro dual variable, p is larger than zero, that's good enough. I, if you study this, a lot of operators are saying, telling you, okay, this is also bounded. You can add a, like bounded information. The, the boundless of the dual variable help us a lot to study the problem. So what do I mean by that? So now let's look at the fundamental limit when we allow the uh, condensation be time varying. So this is a problem class we're going to focus on. Dual problem, convex, L, smooth. So this is our quantization scheme. Let's go, let me go through this. So the quantization, like the, what the information I sent, will depend on the history. And the theta t can change in. And the QT, like how many bit you use per time, can change as well. Like this time you want to put more information, you can put more information, you can also receive the information. So uh, we put all the quantization class as the QP. And the QP, the P here is the, this one. So I kind of assume the P information is available for me. I can use that to design my quantization scheme. And so this is the, like any kind of theta function you put here. So we call that is put them into the set. So the question we're going to ask is these questions. So first, we call it epsilon complexity. So epsilon complexity means if I want to achieve epsilon optimality, what's the minimum number of bit? And the B complex, what I mean is if I have a B bit available, what's the optimal way to use it? Like what kind of the like, optimality I can achieve? So this is the intuition for the uh, of what we have in our mind. And mathematically, how it's translate is to here. So I'm only putting this stopping criterion. We have other op optimality criterion in the problem. So take this problem. So this is the op optimal set because we don't assume it's strong convex. It can be a set of the optimal solution. And so this is my current P. So we try to ask a question. So that's what our definition for epsilon complexity. If I go through is, it has a mean max definition. So the, as I said, it's follow from the communication complexity in literature. So what this means is you take any quantization, any problem, if I want to achieve this optimality, then we'll use a certain number of bit. So we, I'm doing the like, what is the worst case, like the worst problem that will make the bit be large. And then for this one, it's like I want to find the optimal quantization scheme to against those kind of risk I'm going to have. So this is kind of the worst case in this scenario, it's kind of the worst case definition. So like what kind of worst problem going to make my quantization going to fail? Like, Roughly means minimal number of bit to achieve epsilon optimality for every problem D. Question for the definition. I, I, I probably just want to get the definition be clear. Show me a question. It's clear enough. I hope it says all the time. That's okay. Good. Okay. So I will just want to say that like, we have a result for this one. So it's actually log one over epsilon. So by log epsilon, so okay, what exactly that means? So I skip the proof, like for the, this is proof actually very uh, useful, it's happened in many literature, but I want to highlight this one, the achievability. So what exactly that means? So why the one dimension case will different from the high dimension case for the smooth uh, operation problem? So let's, uh, I didn't talk about big complexity, but you can translate this one to another, because this is means if I, if I want to achieve epsilon complexity, how many bits I need? If I translate the convergence rate, so convergence rate means is how close I'm to the optimal solution if I use B bit. It's going to be one over two to the power of B. That is the absolution convergence rate. So what I want to highlight is this is like, because we know the optimal convergence rate for the gradient based method, like I'm talking about gradient based method, for the smooth function is one over T squared. But we have a kind of better convergence rate. What's happening? Because for this one, I like the boundless play an important role, and it's also one dimension. You yeah, can just do the by section search. But the question is, how are you going to design a quantization 
to allow the following users to do the type of bad section search. And this is the quantization scheme that we designed. An interesting thing is, so the definition we allow time varying history, although like and the changing rate. For this one is the quantization scheme. You don't need to use the history. It's only based on the current gradient direction. So the D is a gradient direction, and just like based on the current gradient direction, do kind of certain level bisection search. And this one going to work. You don't need to use the history, and turns out it's actually kind of not that time varying. It's almost like time invariant. Quantization scheme. Uh, two minutes. Okay, yeah. yeah, two minutes because I want to. There's another more interesting fact. Because I talk about stable physical system, I ask people to take action and I have a limited resource. There's something happening. It's like it's well while it's a hard physical constraint, right? If people take action, I haven't really like find a good solution how it's going to while it's a constraint. So how are we going to make sure the physical constraint can be ensured during the transient? This is a much harder question. So we want to make sure the primal of feasibility anytime is going to be feasible. And this one is like much harder than what I presented before. And sometimes the intuition doesn't work. Like the proof is more non-intuitive. So what I want to say is like we have a absolute complexity for the primal of feasible quantization. The primal of feasible quantization is I want the quantization be always with the primal action always be feasible. I say it's a very different result because look here, it's become infinite. It's kind of impossibility result. If you want the primal feasibility, you shouldn't do it in the quantization. Um, now, I don't have time to talk about the proof. But there's another good message for the primal feasibility is if you change your op op optimality criterion, you actually are able to do something. The time varying quantization is going to work if I only care about objective value, not the uh, like action. Like back to Joe's question. And so this convergence rate is like one over B. So like similarly to the smooth co-vasopization problem, like one over T. So this is actually very surprising. And, and this is a quantization scheme. It's not intuitive. It's the intuition that comes from some other study, what kind of natural condition we have like to make sure it's going to be uh, like primal feasible. So I don't have time to talk about that, but it will probably be interesting to see the simulation result. So is if the problem, so the problem we pick, the dual problem which had, even actually had a strongly convex property, the quantized version in practice, that's why I said it always works better than the theory. You do the primal feasible quantization, you still have the linear convergence rate. And you can always guarantee the feasibility during the transient dynamics. With that, that's conclude my talk. And there's a lot of um, like following work to really talk about the reapplication, the, especially the robustness of this. Problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, Sid, uh, why don't you come and get set up while we take a question or two? Yes. Yeah. All right.